the what have they done lately is the question. I don't see why I wouldn't like the 28 puts. That's a seriously low number. So, so yeah, I'd say for sure. And if we just take a quick look at NRG's overalls, NRG. So you got 36 bucks. It's a eight, ten, nine billion dollar market cap. Uh, PE ratio without getting into the numbers is 17.50. So they're reasonably priced. And if you're going down to 28 bucks, uh, obviously, and you're not 28, you're 23.50. By that, 23.50 is uh, one third. I mean, it's about 33% off the current price. So you're actually paying six billion dollars, and you're knocking this down to 12-ish. Uh, so yeah, of course, that's that's fine. There's nothing wrong with NRG's business. Um, although Molly Fool says they think 15% on. Oh, I see. You're taking advantage of the dip today. So what do they do? Let's let's see what Molly Fool says they did. Although Molly Fool is wildly inaccurate. Uh, there was little question what led to the climb. 6 a.m. news outlined financial impacts of oh, the, the winter storm. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. That's a no-brainer, dude. Great move by Brandon. This is the stupidest reason for something to fall uh, uh, based on a storm that impacted their business. People are dumping the stock because the company says, you know what? That really horrible storm that was like a once in a decade thing uh, actually hurt us. And we're going to, and we have a, a, you know, we're going to have a decline in uh, profits and revenues for this thing. Yeah, duh. <laughs> I mean, that is the stupidest reason to sell something, you know, but the problem is people don't have a long-term investment outlook on stuff. So, yeah, Brendan, that's that's so good. I would certainly do it. I mean, it's uh, now I would wait and see when the selling stops as far as it goes before, it's, uh, before getting too serious on it. But that's a good one. They were throwing guidance. Uh, da, 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 da. A $750 million loss seems possible, though it could change based on other developments. Now, does anyone put that into perspective, or do they just read $750 million loss and freak out? So then we look at NRG and say, well, how, how bad is $750 million for them? So here's NRG, and they made... 4.4 billion dollars in tuna. I'm sure they sold off an asset or something like that. But so they, you know, they go up and down. And in a typical year, they're going to pull in nine. They'll pull in a billion dollars. So let's say they don't pull in a billion dollars. And let's say that in 2021 they have a they they are they are they have a 750 million dollar loss. Let's say they barely make any money. How does that impact you going forward? It doesn't. Going forward, you're paying 10 billion dollars for a company that is going to make a billion dollars a year. That's a P of 10. You know, the, the, the 17 times PE is based on this 510 from last year. That's what it's based on. It's not based on the estimate going forward. It's based on last year's 510 from Yahoo. So there's nothing wrong with them with a long-term investment. I mean, people were willing to buy them. And here's the thing. When they were investing in their infrastructure and 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 lost six billion dollars in 2015 and two billion dollars in 2017, what was the stock doing then? So we have 215. In 215, they were at 30 bucks. In 217, where are we? Uh, in 217, they were down to 18 bucks and 10 bucks and 15 bucks. So they have been much lower, and people are freaking. So people are worried looking at this truck that they're going to like dip out and fall down. But I say what he's talking about is selling the um, the twenty eight dollar puts, which are down here. Here's twenty eight. Let's see, that's twenty three. Here's twenty eight, basically. Right, uh, it's lower than that dip. Oh well, hard to find it exactly. Anyway, so somewhere around here is twenty eight bucks. Okay. And so if they go lower, then you then you certainly buy more because it's just even sillier. But I mean, you know, to buy a put, and that's why I wouldn't buy a bull call spread yet. It's like sell the put, see what happens. Because if you sell the put for um what was the price you said? If you sell the put for 450, you've got 450, you can buy a ten dollar spread for free, basically. 
That 450, you put it towards any bull call spread any time, is not gonna be much more than $10 for, for a $5 for a $10 spread. So you're gonna get essentially a free $10 spread by selling those puts. So you're, so if, if you, your, your worst case to the upside is you're only gonna make uh, $10. You know, you're only gonna you're, you're only gonna you're only gonna have a net free practically spread, and it keeps going up, and you make ten bucks. If on the other hand, you, you you're patient, of course. If you're patient and it goes down, so in other words, the same situation. If you're patient and it goes up, you'll only make ten bucks. Okay, that's fine. If you're patient and it goes down, you didn't commit yet. That gives you a chance to roll your puts down, double down possibly on the puts, and. Uh, and pick up a, a, a bull call spread very cheaply, and then you can get more heavily invested. So that's how I would do it. I do it patiently. Uh, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with owning them 24 bucks, which is your net. So your net's here. So your net's down here. And it's been, except for this spot right here, which came from uh, back in 216 when they had some huge, you know, costs. Uh, that's been where they are. This loss is nothing like what they're gonna, what they experienced back here so it's a great place it's, it's such a good place you know <laughs> I, I i again I, if you say recommend a bull call spread my recommendation is not to do a bull call spread unless they go lower if they go higher just be happy you sold the puts or you can buy the puts later if you the bull call spread later if you really want the thing is the bull call spread doesn't change much that here is a good lesson look at what a fun lesson we can have on this thing nrg Energy. So, first of all, when I sell a thread, I want to sell as much premium as I can. So, at the moment, we're selling $35 calls for $8,750, let's say. Uh, or we could sell these guys for $650, $37s. I, I think on the whole, I'd be more conservative. I'd take the $750. And then you say, okay, well, given, given that that's the case, what am I going to buy? And I can buy these are the 35s. So, the 25s are let's say 14. So here is like a $7 spread, maybe a $7 spread, a little bit less 650 spread uh, from the, for the 25, 35 spread. And that's conservative, don't forget. But a 650 spread, the 25, 35 spread is um, gonna, and then minus the 450 you sell the puts for, so now you're in for net two on the, on the spread. So, okay, you're not gonna make 10 bucks, you make eight bucks. Now, let's say it drops $10. If it drops $10, then this spread should probably cost what the 35-45 spread costs, right? The 35 spread is, again, $750, and the 45s are, wow, what a wide spread. Uh, the 45s are, let's say, this is really hard to tell because it's such a freaking, the, the spread is so wide. Let's say, for, for argument's sake, it's $450. So, the 35 spread 750. So the 35-45 spread is only three bucks. So if NRG drops, you'll go from uh, you'll go you'll go from the price of seven dollars on the spread on the on the 25-35 spread. That same 25-35 spread would drop down to like three bucks. So you could buy twice as many with the same money if it goes up. On the other hand, if NRG goes up 10 bucks and you miss it and you say, oh, that damn Phil told me to wait, blah, 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 then it'll be the price of the 1525 spread. And again, around. And again, this is so wide though, it's hard to say. But let's say it's like, let's say it's 22. We'll just pick a number in the middle. So let's say it's like 22 and 13. That doesn't mean any sense. Nine. It's not gonna be nine bucks. It's gonna be like seven bucks, eight bucks. The reality is it will probably only alter the price of the spread by about a buck. Oh, in fact, you can, here's how you can tell. See the deltas? The delta of the 20, the delta of the 15, 87, 25 spread is the difference is, is 10, right? Is, is 11. That's the net delta. The net delta of the 25, 78, 35, 58 spread is 20. So on a $10 move, the difference between the spreads will change by a dollar. So in other words, it will only cost you a dollar more if the stock flies higher to take your spread. But the spread you're taking would still be the same 25, 35 spread. 
I'm, I'm thinking already people are gonna have to play this back like three times to figure it out. <laughs> But, you know, in other words, you're buying this bracket, the 2535 bracket. You're set on that bracket. That bracket, if, if, if NRG goes up $10, that spread will get more expensive. How much more expensive? The difference between the delta of this spread and the next spread. So the 3545 spread has a delta difference of 58 and 40, so 18. So actually, there's no difference at all between the, the remember this had a 20, this had a 20 delta, and this has a 20 delta spread. The so that means that the 25-35 spread compared to the 35-45 spread isn't really going to change much on the way down. Now that's not 100% accurate though, because what happens is the deltas change also, and that delta will creep more towards the delta of the 1525 spread. So you have to take that into account also, but it won't immediately change. It'll gradually get to a, a, a delta of 10. And if it gets to a delta of 10, that means the average delta as it changes will be 15. And so that, so, so I would use 15 for my assumption. And that would mean that it would change by $1.50 on a $10 move. So a $10 move down, I'm sorry, a $10, a $10 move up in price will probably cause your uh, your spread to go up $1.50 in cost, whereas $10 move down in price is apparently going to have very little impact. So that's how, that's how you look at it. You have to figure out, you know, and again, it's like you kill yourself doing that, so it's not worth it. But it's, it's just so you get the idea, you figure out like, okay, this spread is this much and this spread is this much, and therefore if it moves this much, then my, then my bracket's going to change to what the next bracket costs. That's all. And so the bottom line is, you know, the, the short, short story of all that is that uh, basically your, um, your, your, there's no penalty to waiting. You have no reason. There's no reason for you to jump on this because it's only going to cost you if it goes up five bucks. Once it goes past 30, I would make my move because you say, oh, it's, pay, it's over 30 now. So I better take that 25, 35 spread at this point. Um, I'm sorry, over 30, over 40, I'm sorry, I mean over 40. And over 40 is only four bucks away. And if your delta differential is 15, that means it's gonna cost you 60 cents to wait $4. Four bucks is gonna cause a 60 cent change in the price of the spread. So who cares? You Because, because first of all, at that point, you're buying a 25, 35 spread for 60, you know, for, for instead of, uh, what do we say, it was gonna be net, net, instead of net, uh, Instead of net two, you'll be paying net three, let's say, for the for the whole thing, including the puts. So who cares? Because because then, then you're buying a spread that's like in the money to make that to make that play. Um, if it goes the other way, you're going to get a much cheaper spread. So sixty cent penalty if it goes up on you, and and a much cheaper spread. You can buy twice as many probably if it goes down on you. There's no reason not to wait. Tying up your money now. When you don't know what's going to happen, makes no sense. So it's always better to get more information before you trade. Now, on the other hand, given the spike down, given the given the sharp rise in the price of the uh, twenty-eight dollar puts, if you can get four fifty for them, that's a great price. Twenty-three twenty-three fifty is a fantastic net entry price. Take that. That's good enough. I wouldn't go gung ho crazy. Take a number that you are happy to double down on. As long as you're happy to double down, I mean, if you look into January 22, these are 450. What's 450 in January 22? Basically the 33s. So if the 28s are the same price as the 33s, basically, that means that you can expect that by July, if this is going badly, you should be able to roll your short puts down five bucks. So now we're actually talking about, in a long-term perspective, you're probably, you can look forward to a $5 down roll that doesn't cost you anything. So then the question is, what you want to do is be comfortable that you'll be happy to double down when you roll to the 2024 $23 puts. And so if you don't want to own a thousand shares at 23, don't sell five puts at 28. That's just generally the rule of thumb. If you don't want to own, you know, and anytime you're doing puts, that should be your thinking. If you don't want to own double that amount after you roll it, 
don't do the first step. Because over the course of two years, the chance of your stock at some point dropping 20% is really, really high. So it's very likely it's going to go up 20 cents, 20%. It's very likely it's going to go down 20%. Those are normal trading channels. It'd be surprising if it doesn't do that. Oh, you know what? I'm getting in trouble for this thing. Wait an hour. <laughs> my, my computer is very much insisting on being restarted. Um, Hopefully it doesn't mess anything up. There you go. Look how some, now everything looks right. <gasps> Look at that. Oh, that's energy. Jesus. <laughs> it's a hell of a drop. All right. Anyway, somebody remind me in chat because that's like, hang on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's too good to pass up. I got to do that too. Let's sell five N or or G um two oh two three puts four four fifty in the NLTP per oh bring in a per Brendan. Uh, see, that's where a trade comes from. Makes no sense not to do it because in the long-term portfolio, we're going to get, um, can we do 10? Yeah, we can do 10. All right, we can afford it. All right, let's do 10. So we're going to get $4,500 to promise to buy NRG to 1,000 shares of NRG uh, for, for uh, oh, 2023, $28 puts. There you go, that's a little bit more descriptive uh, for 415 the LTP per run. So we're gonna collect $4,500 in exchange for promising to buy NRG for net 2350. That's all we're doing. We're promising to buy $23,500 worth of NRG we're going to get paid four thousand five hundred dollars, which is twenty percent, obviously twenty three thousand um, bucks, just for making this promise. And it's being paid over two years, of course. But now, at the moment, what is it taking up? Our allocation blocks in the long term portfolio, being a, a two million dollar plus, yeah, you know, uh, we have more than two million buying power. So our allocation blocks with more than two million buying power are a hundred thousand dollars each. You divide by 20 your buying power. Um, so we have $20,000 allocation blocks. This doesn't even, this is only using 20% of an or 20% of, of an allocation block. So even if it goes terribly, it's only using 20% of an allocation block. It's hardly worth worrying about as it stands now. It's just a it's just basically a placeholder, but it's a placeholder that pays us five thousand bucks. Okay, and, and and if you do 20 of those, it's $100,000. You know, by the time we sell 20 puts, it's $100,000 worth of short puts. And then if that means something, even in a million dollar portfolio, that means something, doesn't it? So it, it's nothing to be discounted. It seems very boring when we do this and everybody's like, oh, well, we you sell a put, what, you know, what's that trade going to return? It doesn't matter, it's a cumulative thing. And, and of course, as NRG goes higher, if it goes well, there's two things that can happen. It can go lower, and we're going to turn it into a position where we'll put some more cash towards it, but it'll be the same allocation block and the same small use of an allocation block because only the short put is going to really affect our allocation other than the, the cash that we spend, but the net cash spent is going to be very low. So it's really, we're not going to take up a big allocation block on this in either case, but if it goes lower, this could turn from a, uh, a $4,500 spread to something like a $20,000 spread, and or maybe maybe 20, maybe 30, who knows? So it becomes a significant position, even though we're not really gonna spend a much more of our allocation on it. Um, let's say we double it, and we have a $45,000 obligation after when we roll it. 
or $40,000 obligation after we wrote it. Still only 40% of an allocation block. Yet then by then we would be looking to make about $25,000, $40,000 on the upside. So on the day, so, so in other words, before you make a move, and it's just like chess, before you make a move, you think about what am I gonna do if this happens and what am I gonna do if that happens? And if you see a move where one of the one of the possibilities when you make your move is gonna screw you, don't make that move. <laughs> don't move into a checkmate. That's what it is. That's all it is with your portfolio. Leave yourself out. Make sure you're comfortable with all the consequences of the move you're doing. And it's not like chess, because in chess there are you know, a quintillion possible things that can happen when you start going three or four moves down the line. With options, about 27 different possible things that can happen. And I'm talking three moves down. In one move, what's the market going to do? It's going to go up, down, or flat. That's what it's going to do. Why 27? Because the next set, three more things can happen. And now you have nine possibilities. And the next set, three more things can happen. Now you have 27 possibilities. So by the third roll of the of the dice on this on your trade you have 27 possible situations that can happen but that's how far out you should be looking you've got to think what am i going to do if it goes up and down 20 percent or stays flat okay you have to know what you're going to do in that situation now once you know that you say okay after that what am i going to do if it goes up or down 20 percent and stays flat now think about it if it goes up 20 percent you know what you're going to do when you're happy and comfortable with whatever it is, okay? In this case, with a short put, what am I going to do if it goes up 20%? I'm not going to do anything. It's going to expire worthless. So then next, what if it goes down 20%? Well, now I'm back to where we are, and I'm still happy because it's still where I bought the, where I sold the put, and we're much higher than the put, so I don't have an issue with it. The third leg, if it goes down 20%, we're still in good shape. So that means that leg number one, option number one, if it starts out and goes up 20%, I have zero consequences of bottoming. Okay, and now obviously you say, well, what if it goes down 50%? Yes, of course, but we're talking about a normal-ish market and normal situations. If something crazy happens, you have to deal with it. But normally, in the normal course of events, up and down 20% is what you expect something to do over, over, over a reasonable period of time, like less than a year. Um, so, so everything to the upside, not a problem. Now, flat, if it goes flat for six months or a year, what are you gonna do? I'm not gonna do anything, I'm gonna short put, got no problem. If it goes flat and then stage two, it goes up, say so now you're back to where you were at stage one, not a problem, I don't care. If it goes flat and stays flat, not a problem, right? If it goes flat and goes down, ah, now what am I doing? So now I'm going flat and now it's down 20%. If it's down 20%, what am I going to do? Down 20%, I already know since it's, since it's further out in time, I already know I'm going to roll down to the 202, 423 puts and most likely double down at that point, assuming of course nothing fundamentally changed and it's just a stupid move. So I'm comfortable with flat, I'm comfortable with up. Now, what if it goes down 20% in the near future? What is my What am I going to do? Aha! Am I comfortable, number one, owning the stock? Yes, it does not take up much of my allocation block. I do like them long-term. I don't see any reason it's gonna stay down for, for too long. Okay, fine. Now, once it does go down 20% short-term, what am I gonna do? Most likely I'm gonna do nothing in the short-term and wait and see what happens. If it goes down another 20%, I have to do something. So if it goes down another 20%, as I said, I'm happy to own it. And if I say I'm happy to own it, it means I'm happy to double down. I will roll out and I will double down most likely, and I will also most likely add a bull call spread. So my downside scenario, even if it goes down 20% twice, I'm, I'm probably gung-ho enthusiastic about the stock, unless of course something dreadful happens to them, but we just don't see that coming. Uh, maybe it'll snow in July, could happen. <laughs> I mean, in other words, what happened to them was unique and ridiculous, and unlikely to repeat itself. So why would they have this, why would they have a horrible 20% drop again later? Will it snow in July? No, it probably won't snow again until next December. So then it'll be a year later, then I can roll all the way out till, till 2024, definitely by then, and drop five bucks for free. 
and then I could roll out and double down and drop 10 bucks. I don't see this as a bad scenario. I could roll out, double down, drop 10 bucks, and buy a bull call spread that's really cheap. I hope that happens. I hope it snows again in January and freezes everybody in Texas. Sorry, people in Texas, but it would be nice because it'd be great for that trade. And still not using much of an allocation block. And that's how you end up making a trade. So in other words, after I go through that exercise and I'm happy with all the possible scenarios, then I make the trade. If, if I'm running this through my head and I come to a spot where I go, ooh, I wouldn't like that at all. That would really suck. I shouldn't make the trade. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to be in a, in a, in a place where you, th where you could easily uh, regret having the trade. That's all. And that just requires thinking ahead. And, and and see, it's interesting because here we are, it's 1.30 now, so we've been talking about it for like almost a half hour. Um, <laughs> that's, you guys ask me questions in chat and I look at this, I, I look at something and then you say, well, what, what about this and what about that? It, that's how long it takes me to figure out, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to verbalize it, so maybe not that long, but I'm doing my head. But the point is, I have to look at stuff and think of things and look out and look at the prices and check the things and so on and so forth. Then I come back and say, no, I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah. And I know you guys think I'm like, oh, geez, that's all I get out of this guy. But honestly, it's, that's what we go through every single time. We're analyzing what's happening. Oh, I never hit it. I never hit send on this. So that's how we get to that. And that's how we end up making a, a, a top trade. After I make a trade, I might do a top trade alert. We're not doing it on that one, though, but we are doing it on this one. So Facebook is going to be a top trade. So I really like that one. And we'll go over that in a minute, but first let me do my alert. Okay. Um, how much was this good for? 22.350. FB trade idea and then and turn a 2.350 credit into 22.350. At 300. All right, so that's that's our Facebook trade. It's an idea that can turn out, and we'll we'll take a look at it in a second. So why Facebook? Well, it was so, so cheap compared to the other tech stock. All the other techs are, are, are crazy prices. Apple's not so crazy, but, but Apple's so big, I don't see it being able to do anything like this. But Apple's already a $2 trillion company. Facebook's a $750 billion company. It's a big difference. Um, so Facebook can grow. Apple, hard to grow. Facebook has the cash. Here's the thing. Apple makes $70 billion a year. Facebook makes $35 billion a year. Okay, so Apple is valued at three times what Facebook is valued almost. That's problem number one. Problem number two, uh, how is Apple going to expand? Apple is going to take their $70 billion and they're going to uh, invest it into other things. Well, Facebook can do that too. Facebook can make self-driving cars. Facebook can do what Amazon does. Facebook can do what all these guys do. They tend not to. They tend to buy things that um, – Facebook tends to buy things that help Facebook. They don't tend to, they don't really care about, they're not looking, they don't do a lot of, uh, they're not launching satellites and they're not doing this and that. They're not doing all these fun, weird things, but they could. And frankly, one of the reasons is because Facebook keeps a pretty low profile because of this. Um, let me think of uh, anything. How many Facebook users? 2.8 billion monthly active users. That's, you know, getting close to pretty much everybody in the world who has access, who has a computer is on Facebook. All right, how many? Apple. Apple has 1.65 devices in active use. So a billion, so basically, what are the billions? Uh, two-thirds so two-thirds more people 
use Facebook than Apple. That's a, that's a pretty big difference. So they have two thirds more people using Facebook than, than anything Apple can monetize, Facebook can monetize. They've got the reach. They've got the same advertising base. They've got the same everything. Facebook keeps a pretty low profile generally because they are dangerously endemic. Okay, they're, they're very scary to governments. They're scary to business. They're scary to everybody. They don't jump into those. Facebook doesn't jump into the movie business, doesn't do this and that. They buy other companies and try to do some stuff on the side, but they don't, they don't like to try to take over the universe like Amazon and Apple are now. As Amazon and Apple do more to take over the universe, Facebook begins to uh, Facebook companies. So now Facebook has Instagram, Facebook has, uh, where is it? So there's going to be like a list. Oh, here you go. So Facebook has, well, Messenger's not a company. Facebook has Instagram, Facebook has WhatsApp, Facebook has Oculus, which is going to be huge, by the way. It's only in very early days. And I see they got friend feed, they have live rail, they have Giphy. And Giphy is huge, by the way. And this and this um, NFT, what is it called? I forget. The stupid thing where they sell with the, they're selling graphics and stuff. This is, Giphy is, is the king of this thing. They're going to be able to monetize that. And that's going to be an incredible thing. Facebook's going to be able to monetize um, the, these, uh, these uh these crypto sales that are it's going to be a huge thing down the road um facebook is the king of advertising they killed twitter they killed everybody if you want to advertise effectively facebook is the place to do it you reach everybody on the planet who has money basically uh you reach everyone on the planet who has money and you and and they're targeting and their knowledge of you because you People spill out their entire lives to Facebook. Their knowledge of the users is unbelievable. Unbelievable what they, they know much too much about you. It's horrifying. <laughs> it looks like you're using that blocker. I damn sure I am. Um, so, so if Facebook starts getting aggressive the way Amazon and Apple are aggressive about putting their money to work, they can easily buy a company that's throwing off five billion more in revenues. And the thing is also, now that's gonna impact Facebook more than it would impact. See, Facebook's got, how much money does Facebook have? There's a question too. How much cash does, cash does face? So Facebook had $54 billion. They, they you know, certainly didn't go down much. Um, and by the way, that's also a funny thing, because when you look, you know, you look at $750 billion valuation, 50 billion was cash. So it's really a $700 billion valuation. Apple has the same thing though. It's embarrassing how much money Apple has. Apple's got $200 billion in cash. But the thing is, since Facebook has one third the valuation of Apple, Facebook can make a purchase that adds $5 billion to the bottom line. It's going to have much more of an impact on them than if Apple makes a purchase that adds $10 billion to the bottom line. Now, logically, Apple should buy Facebook. <laughs> well, and then Google too. Google's another one taking over the world, right? So. You know, Zuckerberg is very into his like little world and making that and everything has to be part of Facebook and maybe he's philosophically opposed to it. Who knows what the deal is, but they have gotten more aggressive. They have expanded and they have the potential to really push out and start doing more things. And I think they will. I just think that they would like the regulatory scrutiny to move away from them and on to 
Apple and Google and uh, Amazon and let them take some of the heat. And while they're doing that, then Facebook can make an acquisition that may, that that pushes the scope of the company out further. But when you've got 3.2 billion or whatever the hell the number it was, 2.8 2.8 billion people, monthly users, these are people actually using the thing. Um, when you have that many people were on a program, you you it's carte blanche. I mean, you know, look look what people spend. Ah, here's a good good example. Think of what people spend to advertise on the Super Bowl, right? So here's a way to figure out how how valuable it is to be Facebook. Um, how much for a Super Bowl ad? I think it was five million dollars for thirty seconds. Uh, da 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 da. How much does it cost to advertise? Five point five million. Okay, so five point five million for thirty seconds. So that's question number one. It costs five point five million dollars for thirty seconds. Um, what was my other question? Oh, oh, oh. Um, how much? Wait, no, wait. There was another point I was going to make. It was a Super Bowl ad. How much money do you spend on a Super Bowl ad? Oh, how many people watch the Super Bowl? That's right. How many people watch? The Super Bowl. A hundred million people watch the Super Bowl. So Facebook reaches 28 more times people than the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl gets 5.5 million for 30 seconds. Now you know that people are engaged for 30 seconds on Facebook. It's kind of hard to open Facebook and not spend 30 seconds on it. So you know they're getting that. Um, uh, oh. Uh, how average use of Facebook? Facebook revenue usage statistics, 2020. See, everything's online. I love that. Functionality, blah, blah, blah. Away, Jesus Christ! How come you can't have an everything blocker? Usage statistics. There's no number here. That wasn't useful. Oh, oh God! You gotta go back to the thing. Come on. Oh my God, all this data. Uh, I have no idea how much I love this kind of stuff. <laughs> Average Facebook, 37 minutes a day. There you go, 37 minutes a day. So, now we take 37 times 5 point, oh no, sorry, times 11 million. But it's two to two times 36 so 37 times 11 million 407 million dollars times two point well it has to be times 2.8 billion it had to stick we were using millions right so 37 million 28 million and 11 is the number of millions of dollars that it's that the ads are worth so wait, 30, I'm sorry, 37 minutes times, oh, I'm sorry, times that's how much per minute, right? Yeah. So I believe that's one trillion dollars. <laughs> so in other words, if Facebook were priced like the Super Bowl for advertising, it would be one trillion dollars per day of advertising revenue. That's what that number comes up to. That's that, and that, and that's, and and obviously that's ridiculous because you say, well, it's not always the Super Bowl, or whatever. But no, people are engaged on Facebook. What is the Super Bowl about? You advertisers want to know that a person is sitting there looking at the screen, and they're going to put their message up. Facebook can guarantee it. Now, the difference is that in Facebook, you are not 
forced, and of course you're not forced in the Super Bowl because you're eating chips, you're having pizza, you go in the bathroom, but you're forced to watch a 30 second commercial. You're not forced to watch a 30 second commercial on Facebook. So we could look at that and say, okay, well, people are only exposed to uh, 60 seconds, or I'm sorry, to one, to one second or two seconds of an ad. So let's say we divide this by 30, and now it would be, $37 billion a day. So let's say it's $37 billion a day, 37 billion times 365 days, and it's $13 trillion. So clearly, Facebook could monetize their stuff more. That's the bottom line. I mean, in other words, with that kind of platform and that kind of reach, Facebook could monetize in an extreme fashion. They've got your eyeball for 37 minutes a day, They've got 2.8 billion people. And they're drastically underselling it. That's the, bottom, that's the bottom line. They're drastically underselling it. Now, one reason is, though, that because if you think of that as total amount of eyeball time versus the total amount of eyeball time there is in the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl only has let's say uh 45 minutes worth of commercial time to sell so it's like an auction right it's like a, it's like something rare to have a super bowl 30 seconds is only let's say 90 of them to sell there's only 90 30 second spots for the super bowl to be able to sell at all uh facebook has a thousand times a hundred times or, or whatever number we said so facebook has nine thousand spots to sell Therefore, even though it's more valuable in aggregate, the number, the the uh, lack of rarity of the of the advertising spot causes it to be diluted and is wrecked the market. They need to think about that. And if I was in Facebook, I would <clears throat> I would consider ways to uh, to to make the advertising a more premium thing because they they don't. And you know there is too much crap on Facebook. No, let's just go to Facebook. Hey, my buddy Bernie. <laughs> let's see. Da -da -da. Anyway, so, so, I mean, this is the thing about Facebook. So this is advertising. What does that mean? Your order is waiting. See, this is I, I, so creepy, though, isn't it? So I, I drink Fiji water. I actually subscribe, and I have it dropped off on a regular basis to my house. So I get Fiji water. Uh, I do live in Rockland County. Um, but, the, but this one's an ad. That one's actually some group of Rockland County people. Uh, but Barbara sent that. Lauren sent me donuts for some reason. <laughs> Elizabeth bought a car. What is this? This is probably an ad. I don't know who this guy is. So there's an ad. There's an ad. This is what I think the problem with Facebook is. Too many ads. If there were less ads, I'd be more inclined to read them. Um, that's actually very low exposure, though. Actually, we might have to, to, to make a smaller number because it's like my, my exposure to this is, is less than a second as I'm going past it. Uh, this is too many ads, though. Now, UNICEF, I mean, come on. Is Roger Fink eating a sandwich? <laughs> this is why I don't go on Facebook. Lisa, crowd count again an ad. Holy crap. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Lauren's got a good life. Uh, what does my daughter think is funny? Perhaps they should deal with rap lyrics before they attack my books. Okay. All right. That's my daughter. I have to talk to her. She's a college kid. Nobody attacked anything. Um, what? <laughs> St. Patrick's Day for my Irish friends. More old stuff. Okay, so now, now we want to do... Oh, no, there's an ad. Look at all these freaking ads. <laughs> Oh. 
Oh, she's cool. Look at her. I don't know if you guys can see this. Maybe you can't see the video. <laughs> I don't know if it's resolving across the uh, thing. All right, all right, get to the point. Cool. Minute. I'll give this thing a refresh. Let's see how we're doing. We had 29 million last week. What day is this? 310. 29 million last week. Doesn't say how many US deaths, but we're not going to worry about that right now. And now we have, drum roll please, play the telethons, right? 29.5, so we have 400,000. That's, that's actually not bad. So 400,000, we were having 300,000 cases a day for a while. This is only, we only want 400,000 in a week. So I'm, I'm very proud, I'm glad. That, that means we're under 100,000 a day of new cases. Still horrible, but. At least it's slowing down a little bit. It's not like completely out of control. All right, good. So that's happy. Let's see if we have any more questions. By coincidence, Sandberg, the uh, COD of Facebook is on uh, CNN. It's on is on BNN right now. That's funny. So Cheryl Sandberg's on uh, BNN. <coughs> Probably, probably knew I was talking about her. <laughs> she ran out. But yeah, I mean, they, they're, they I, I don't know, I'm interested in what, whatever she had to say, but the bottom line is they, they certainly think they're undervalued, so. Um, the potential is there, you know, and that's what you want out of these tech companies, the potential. Hold it for 10 more years, it should be double. That's all you need. Then we need to keep making these trades and make some money. So at the moment, the Nasdaq's down 150, the S&P is down 22, the Dow is up 30. And that's where we are for the day. I think I have the Dow shorts. Um, let's see, what do I have? Da, 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 da. Yeah, I got two Dow, um, whatever the hell they are. Uh, they're short 32.8. So from up here, we're short. And at the moment we're down a bit. So we'll see what happens from the Fed. We already cashed in the, uh, what were we? RTYs, not all. I don't have any oil shorts, do I? So RTY is gone. And it's only 1860 for the day because most of the money was made yesterday. Uh, that, and that went down a bit more, but but I, we were right. I mean, look, we had a, and clearly, see, here's the thing. We, we came to 2,300, obviously a weak bounce off 2,300. Didn't really go anywhere. Therefore, you know, the next time it crosses 2,300, you can short it again. That goes back to what I was talking about this morning. Uh, let's take a look at the Fed, though, and see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Not the minutes, it's kind of a meeting. Meeting count. Uh, uh. Here we go. <clears throat> Any minute now, we should get the information. Very democratic, right? Though it used to be, if you think about it, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, let's say. 20 years ago, there was no freaking internet or barely an internet. You couldn't just go online and see the Fed the second it came out. You had to subscribe to a Bloomberg terminal or have a service or something like that that gave it to you. Or you had to wait for it to come on TV and the TV people to read it to you, but it didn't give you the full picture. Um, you know, life, life is great now. It's amazing what you can find. Look at all the research we just did. 
you know, look how fast we just did like massive research into Facebook and their operations in like a half hour. Like, okay, what did we find out? We found we found out how much, you know, we found out how much advertising is worth, how much people pay for ads, how much how much potential advertising revenue Facebook has, how many users, how many eyeballs, how many minutes, blah, blah, blah. We're we're like digging into statistics. You know, I used to take hours and hours of research to find these things out. And sometimes you have to take days, sometimes you have to go somewhere, sometimes you have to go find things out, you have to pay for for, for all this stuff to get to get done. I mean, you know, this is incredible things that we're able to do these days. You know, what kills the internet is advertising. It's, it's, it really kills the usefulness of the internet. There's so much crap. You know, what you're looking for is out there, but also buried under a ton of crap. And the crap, if it's advertising, takes precedence over the useful stuff. One of the Google guys, is um starting a company and i will invest in this company um one of the google guys is starting a company uh to run an ad free internet and i am a hundred percent in favor of that i would gladly just like hbo right i would gladly pay twenty dollars a month to have the internet without the crap It's worth more than twenty dollars. I'd rather have that than HBO. I'd, I mean, if you tell me I can have a crap-free internet, I will pay some good money for that. But I would certainly pay twenty bucks a month. And you know what? So will a uh, hundred million people. And that's going to be a huge business. And don't forget, it doesn't cost money to have a crap free internet it's it's he's not making the sites he doesn't have to build it he only has to filter the crap he only has to say if you if you can't present your information for free to my users you cannot be on my internet so there won't be ad block you know there won't be pop-ups there won't be things coming up there won't be um, um, you know, subscribe to read this blah 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 bullshit. Um, you have to decide as a provider if you are going to make a, an ad for internet for your for people to go to, and if not, you're going to lose these people. You know who you're going to lose? The people who could, the top people. You're going to lose the top one percent, the people who can afford twenty bucks a month and think that's a good investment because they value their time. But holy crap, I mean, could you imagine if you're like trying to find, like if you want to find the best restaurant in your area and you actually get a list of the best restaurants in your area instead of whoever, whatever restaurant put the word best in their HTML and, and, and paid money to, to Yelp or whoever to advertise it. If you go back to what the internet was supposed to be 20 plus years ago, what they actually were attempting to do back in the 90s, when, when it was supposed to be a free and easy access to all the information in the world, it is out there. We have all the information in the world, but it's a mess. It's buried. Oh, okay, Fed. Um, seven of 18 Fed officials see at least one rate hike in 2023. Fed holds the target rate. Of course they hold the target rate steady. What else are they going to do? So there's no news here at all, although we're getting a positive reaction from the market to it. Well, we have positive. The Fed forecast shows 2.2% core inflation. <clears throat> That's above their target rate, interestingly enough. So what do they say about this? Let's see now. Oh, you know what they got this time? They probably got... um. Uh, economic data. I love economic data. Projections. Yay. <laughs> All right. We're going to have some fun now. All right. Let's look at the statement. All right. You have to, ma you have to maximize your bullshit detector. Uh, put it, put it, turn it up to 11, as they say in uh, Spinal Tap. Um, all right. Blah, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic is causing tremendous, right, tremendous human and economic hardship. But the market's at an all-time high, both in the United States and around the world. But the market's at an all-time high. 
following a moderation in the pace of a moderation in the pace of recovery, but the market's at an all-time high. Indicators of economic activity and employment have turned up recently. Oh, I'm sorry. So following a moderation, that's a weird way to put it. So we were moderating, but now it's getting better. Oh, that's good. Although the sectors most adversely affected by the pandemic remain weak. Mm -hmm. Inflation continues to run below 2%. No, it doesn't. You just said it was 2.2%. You just said in your own forecast it was 2.2%. How is that below 2%? Overall financial conditions remain accommodative, no shit, in part reflecting policy measures to support the economy and the flow of credit to U.S. households and businesses. The path of economic recovery will depend significantly on the course of the virus, including progress on vaccinations. The ongoing public health crisis continues to weigh on economic activity. Uh, okay, so again, the ongoing public health crisis continues to weigh on acti economic activity, but the market is in the all-time high. Employment inflation, but the market's in the all-time high, and poses considerable risk to the economic outlook, but the market's at an all-time high. Hey, think about how ridiculous this is. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment and inflation. <laughs> I think you should take that. I think you should take this statement by itself. The, the committee seeks to make to achieve maximum employment and inflation at 32 percent over the longer run. With inflation running persistently below the longer run, the committee will aim to achieve inflation moderately above two percent for some time, so that inflation averages two percent over the time and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at two percent. Committee expects to maintain an accommodative stance of monetary policy until these outcomes are achieved. So, in other words, more, same accommodations forever. The committee decides to keep the target rate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it will be appropriate to maintain until the labor market condition agree the levels consistent with the committee's assessment of maximum employment. Now, let's keep in mind that they did not consider 3% unemployment to be maximum employment. We currently have like 7% unemployment. They didn't consider 3% maximum employment. It would take to re-employ the 10 million people that have lost their jobs due to COVID that still don't have their jobs back, even if we gain a million jobs a month, which is highly unlikely. It'll take a whole year just to get back to 3%, which they still didn't consider maximum employment, even though that's ridiculous because at any given time, one in 50 people are between jobs. That's normal. You know, people change jobs, especially think about think about when you were in college and high school and crap. I mean, you had eight jobs. So, you know, that, that average is in. It's still a job. You're still out of work. You still quit a job. You're still unemployed. It's, it all counts. It's real. You got a paycheck. You had a real job. So to say that you want to get less than 3% unemployment to be a maximum means you'll never be a maximum. You will never consider employment maximum. Um, the Federal Reserve will continue to increase holdings of the Treasury by at least, at least 80 billion a month. At least 80 billion a month. That's uh, what? Uh, one, it's like one trillion a year, basically. And mortgage-backed securities by 40 billion, 500 billion a year, until sustainability, sub substantial future progress will be made towards the committee's maximum employment price stability. So again, forever. Talking like two years at least before they intend to change this policy. These asset purchases help foster smooth market function, accommodate, blah, blah, blah. In assessing appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information. Committee be prepared, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's no God. Could you possibly say less? All right, so now it's up to Pal who comes on in like 20 minutes. Now, here comes the fun part. Data. Data, data, data. All right, what do we got? All right, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so projections, here we go. For each period, medias made middle projections, projections are ranging the lowest to highest. And lower, lower. The central tendency excludes the three highest and three lowest projections. Oh, that's interesting, okay. So, Change in GDP, one year only, 
That's a median. I don't like median. They should really, I like Central Tennessee is better. But it's still around the same. It's about 6.3%. But after that, look what happens to us. 3 to 3.8, 2 to 2.5, 1.8 to 2. That is not a really good run. Oh, and by the way, oh, I see this something today, by the way. We were talking about the spending and the debt and so on and so forth. You know what we forgot about is climate change. We have to spend $10 trillion in the next 10 years on climate change. Or, we were, or we're going to die. That's not in the budget. That's not in our debt projections at all. And it's not just us, the rest of the world's got to do something very similar. So we're not going to be $30 trillion in debt next year or now. I think we're, or I'm sorry, yeah, next year. We'll be $30 trillion in debt next year or by the end of this year. But we're not, we're going to be $30 trillion and then we're going to be, and, and, and we're going to be $50 trillion in debt in 10 years. Very likely $55 trillion in debt in the next 10 years because we have to spend, no matter what, a trillion dollars a year. And by the way, at the same time, I start collecting my Social Security checks. I'm going to be 58 next next uh, in two weeks. So I, I am seven years away, like, like it'll ever happen, right? I'm seven years away from my Social Security checks. And so are, and I'm the back of the baby boom. I'm, I'm six, 1963 is basically the end of the baby boom. So when I get my social security check, that's when there's gonna be maximum pressure on the program plus Medicare, of course. Um, and those costs are gonna increase and the budgets, so, so you know, when you talk about balancing the budget and getting spending under control and this and that, it's not even a, a remote possibility. This, this stuff is going to be a, a noose around our necks for, for the next decade. And, and we can't not spend on the infrastructure. We can't, because the, the, the roads, the bridges, and things like that are falling apart. The electrical grid is falling apart. And all those things matter in the climate change, as we just saw in Texas. That's what happens when you don't spend money on infrastructure. And the climate change starts to affect you. But the climate change just to fix it, the trillion dollars a year. The damage that's gonna be caused by climate change could be a trillion dollars a year, but we won't even, really, don't even worry about that. But seriously, there's almost no escaping that we're gonna be $50 trillion in debt in 10 years. And the 2% interest, that's adding a trillion dollars a year to our debt at just 2%. If the interest is 4%, 2 trillion a year. If the interest is 6%, 3 trillion a year. You know what three trillion a year is? That's our total tax base in interest. That's 100% of our tax base would be having to go towards paying the interest on our debt without any government function whatsoever. Is this market reflecting that? Is this market in any way, shape or form showing, you know, having any indication that there may be something to be concerned about? I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, all right, so there's that. <laughs> they have raised the projection from December from 4.2 to 6.5, uh, and otherwise kept everything about the same otherwise. Unemployment rate, 4.5. Oh, it's only 4.5. Okay, unemployment rate, 4.5. I thought it was like still around 7, but I'm totally wrong. Um, so it's 4.5 now, and... The December projection was 5%, so it is coming down pretty fast. Um, next year, 3.9, then 3.5. But like I said, though, they, you know, if we're only going to get to 3.9 and 3.5, that means we're never, according to the Fed, going to be at full employment. They can just keep pumping money in, apparently, and they have to. You know why they have to? Because we're going to be $50 trillion in debt. We are running, a, a left to our own devices, we are running a bankrupt country. And it's not just us, it's the whole world, so everybody has to deal with the home. And that's the only, the only reason it's not a catastrophic thing is because the whole world is in the same situation. 
everybody's screwed. And if everybody's screwed, we'll figure it out because we're all screwed. If, if some people weren't screwed, it would be a problem. There are people who could take this to their advantage, like China at one time was able to take the credit situation to their advantage. They did not. They did not press their advantage when they had no debt and everybody else had debt. Now it's too late because now China is as bad as we are for debt. So China, instead of uh, instead of foreclosing on everybody, which they could have done, they decided to instead boost their own economy to catch up to everybody else. And unfortunately, doing that put them in the same boat as everybody else, where they now are massively in debt. Um, inflation, inflation, the actual inflation. Look at how fast it's climbing. It was projected at one point eight. It's two point four. Uh, it was, uh, and then, and the long term, they, and, and again, they're 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 fantasy land here. They're 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 not changing their long term projections. Two 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 one one nine two one. Okay, so inflation went up thirty percent in a month. Yet they don't think it's going to actually have any long term effect on them. They're crazy. Uh, the core inflation again. Also, look, this is core, not just regular inflation. Core inflation up significantly. But they don't believe it's going to happen. They're not even projecting into 2023. Uh, the Fed funds rate. Look, look at this graph. This is why the market pops up. Fed funds rate. 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Okay, that's fine. So we're never going to have a, a Fed funds rate, except that in the longer run, people are saying 2.5. 2.5 going from 0 0.1 to 2.5, which which exactly is what I'm talking about. That'll push the bond rates because right now the Fed funds rate is 0 0.1 and the bonds are uh, are two are two percent. So if the Fed goes to 2.5 percent, the bonds are going to be at four percent, maybe five percent. Five percent on 50 trillion dollars is all of our money in interest. Can't do it. Can't do it. That's when it all blows up. You're going to come to a point where all the money that the government has has to go out as interest. And you can't cut spending because the spending is the interest. And if you raise taxes, you tank the economy and you collect less money, blah, blah, blah. You're screwed. You're totally, totally screwed. So the only thing that they can do is to grow their way out of this. That's the Hail Mary pass. They want, they have to triple the GDP. They have to make inflation grow so fast that the bonds, the, the $50 trillion of debt that's outstanding becomes effectively worthless. They have to get us from it from a $20 trillion GDP to a $100 trillion GDP. And and maybe seven and maybe the debt will go up to a hundred trillion and at least they'll get it down to hundred percent of GDP in debt. You can't have debt be two hundred and fifty percent of GDP. You can't sustain that. There's nothing that you can do because if they if if the uh, interest on debt is three trillion dollars, they would have double taxes just to keep things the way they are. That would be a catastrophe. So it's really not an option. They do the dot plots, what do they do here? Median central tendency, blah, 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 blah. Come on, where are those dot plots? People love that stuff. Da, 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 da. Oh, God. Risk to GDP growth, uncertainty. Uh, it's all fun to read, but not right now. Fusion indexes. Wow, is it? It's their intention to bore you to death. I don't want you reading any further. <laughs> Historical error ranges. Look at these, look at these error ranges. <laughs> we can be off by a hundred percent. Historically, we have. Historically, we've been off by the entire thing. <laughs> Guys, we have a 2% usual GDP. They've been off by, by plus or minus 1.6, plus or minus 2.1. They have 
no freaking actual idea. They're just making up numbers. They can't be held accountable. And there's no dot plot. Why is there no dot plot? I thought that was like a, a big feature. All right. So, let's see what our friends at the Wall Street Journal have to say about this. Fed holds steady on rates. Da 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 da. Oh, Powell's coming on shortly. That'll be interesting. Wow, S and P is now green. Holy cow! You've got to be kidding me. Nasdaq completely erased its losses. Uh, projected year in unemployment, blah, 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 blah. Projected PCE inflation. So, so in other words, unemployment goes down. Inflation barely moves, though, doesn't matter. And there's nothing exciting here at all. Okay, no dot plots, no nothing else. All right, well, whatever. So in other words, they're basically counting on this thing to just keep going the way it's going. New houses are costing more as prices jump for wooden bricks, but how would that possibly affect inflation? Can't affect inflation. <laughs> we don't count that. JC says, I haven't yet established any butterfly plays in the account. I'm considering establishing Mondelez and, and uh, Coca-Cola plays. Both are relatively high in the channel. Is it a mistake to establish a butterfly play in a high market when these stocks are high in the channel? When is the optimum time to initiate a butterfly play? Can you please discuss? All right, you know, I go over the, um, the butterfly portfolio on a regular basis, uh, and we talk about things that are good for new trades. So the best time to do it is when we say good for new trades. Uh, and, and, you know, not that I'm the be-all and end-all of when to do something, but, you know, on the one hand, it doesn't really matter much with the butterfly plays. Um, when we go in, but the you know, it, it's all relative because the, the play, the, the, the actual trade is only a backstop for the, for the spread. Now, of course, you want to go out to 2023 for one thing if you're doing a new one. But, but you know, I certainly don't want to go into that, but it's it's the concept of it. So Mondelez, let's say Mondelez, it doesn't, 57 is a bit high. And yeah, that's that's the thing. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to get into a stock and set up a spread. That's not it. So, you know, we, we picked up Mondelez. When did we do it? March 23rd, well, there, we we picked up Mondelez when it was super cheap. You know, that's when we jumped in. It was like, it went down, it's a great company. We said, why would you, well, you know, it's like, it's too cheap to not buy. So sometime in March, we picked up Mondelez. That's why we got it though. We got it because it was cheap. So uh, uh, today we were talking about, um, who just sold off NRG? Well, no, NRG is not really a good example. NRG is probably not good for a butterfly play. But you want to pick up something. No, it's not even that cheap yet. You want to get things that are cheap for a butterfly play. You want to get things that are steady, MDLZ. It was a very unusual situation, and that's why the butterfly portfolio is up some ridiculous amount, 300%. Because we were able to grab all these great bargain stocks at uh you know in during the year we got all these incredible bargains thrown at us as the market crashed and we were able to pick up things at super cheap prices we were aggressively bullish which we usually are not aggressively bullish in the long-term portfolio but again we go back to our old favorites it's like a reflex all right and by the way you know it's it's no it's it's a weird thing that people don't like, people don't like to trade the same stocks over and over again, but if Goldman Sachs hires me, and they and, and I've talked to them, you know, we, I, I talk to Wall Street people every once in a while. Um, but when I was a kid and I, and I actually wanted to work on Wall Street, or I thought I wanted to work on Wall Street, um, you know, when they hire you, they hire you and they put you at a trading desk. And if you're lucky, you'll be in a trading desk that handles a certain space. But a lot of times you'll be at the trading desk that handles one stock and you graduate to a, a, a tech trader or something like that. You know, it, it's, 
you know, the, those are the positions that they put people in because that's the model they want. They want you to specialize in trading a stock. They want you to know a company inside, outside, backwards and sideways and get to know the way it moves, the way it goes and so on and so forth. There's a reason that a lion eats mainly gazelles, you know, like that or whatever. It's like they, they eat the things that they know how to catch. They eat the stuff that's usual. They don't go looking for new stuff to eat. They don't go wandering around Africa finding new hunting grounds. No, they like a lion is born in a hunting area. He stays in that hunting area his whole life, and he hunts the same freaking things his whole life. They can eat anything. They can eat any kind of mammal, but why would they? They got the four or five things they like to eat. That's what they eat. They got things they don't eat. They stay away from hippos. They stay away from elephants. Why? Because they can they can hurt them. Why go after things that can hurt you? So trading is like that. You're supposed to be trading for your life, not trading. Uh, it's not a sport. It's your. It's it's something you're supposed to be doing for the future of yourself and your family and your retirement and so on and so forth. So don't eschew going into trading and trading the same stuff. So what do we do when when the chips hit the fan? When the shit hits the fan, the, ch and the chips are down. Um. You know, so what do we do? We buy Whirlpool. We love Whirlpool. We buy it all the time. Okay. We go Model A. Hey, there's a crisis. Let's see if Model A is cheap. Yes, it is. Let's buy it. Oh, here's a crisis. Is Coca Cola cheap? We love Coca Cola. Yeah, Coca Cola was cheap. We bought that. Okay. Uh, gold. We bought gold before the actual crash, but as soon as it started getting cheap, we jumped into gold and bought that. Barrick. Uh, Ford. Yep, we love Ford. So Ford got cheap and we bought it. Uh, Disney, oh, Disney got cheap. We bought it. And by the way, when I say we bought it, we bought some, and then we really cranked it up. When uh, you know, it just doesn't reflect that. It shows the original purchase date. But we didn't start out with seventy-five. We started out with a more modest one, and we cranked it up because it got so cheap. Um, and Amazon, oh, well, you know, we, Amazon went on sale. We bought it. End of story. Apple, obviously. That's the butterfly portfolio. What got cheap? What got cheap that we like, not what got cheap, not what random crap is cheap. What stocks that we think are fantastic are cheap. And it's the same thing. So you need to have a watch list and you should have 20 stocks and you should have like 20 stocks that you're looking at that you would like to put in the butterfly portfolio if they get cheap. And then you, what you have to have is patience. And you have to wait, just like a lion, right? What does a lion do? 90% of the time they sit on their ass and they look. And all they're doing is looking around and saying, hmm, anything to eat? No. Okay. You know, anything to eat? Nope. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the life of a lion, basically. And if something comes by and if something it, it catches his eye and he says, oh, there's something I can eat, he goes after. Otherwise, no, sit around, no problem. Um you got to be like that. You got to be able to sit there and patiently wait for an opportunity. And if it doesn't come, when we build this butterfly portfolio, and by the way, go, go, go to, uh, go to Phil Stock World, go to the virtual portfolios, go back in time, go to older. You see, you don't have to go back for it. Here's January 2020. We started the new butterfly portfolio. Whoa, that's 2019 already. So we're not even going very far back. Um, we started the new portfolios in uh, October or November of last year. So, oh, that's 2018, no kidding. What, what the hell? What went wrong there? So that's January 28th, 2019. Oh, here you go. January 15th, 2020. November portfolio review, September portfolio review. Okay, so let's see what we did. Here is September of 2019, when we were so young and innocent and didn't know about the crash or anything else, right? So, oh, no, we had not closed the portfolio yet. This is the old stuff. So not that review. 
this review. There you go. See how small those are? All right, so here's the short-term portfolio at the time. Here's the money to our portfolio. Only had a couple of stocks in it. Um, here's the butterfly portfolio. Oh, haha, ha, silly me. We didn't close the butterfly portfolio. That's how few trades we make in the butterfly portfolio. We didn't. We never closed the butterfly portfolio. I forgot about that because there was no reason to. Because the butterfly portfolio is, uh, it doesn't work the way the other portfolios work. So from January second, two thousand eighteen. So this was back in. Um, all right. So this is December of two thousand nineteen. So this is two years into the butterfly portfolio. That's why, oh, that's why we're up so much in the butterfly portfolio. Because we started, we, we weren't, we didn't start from zero. I wonder why we were up so much in that thing. It's because we didn't start from zero. We started with $193,000 at the beginning of the year. Um, so we only had Apple, Disney, Mondelay, MJ, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we bought and sold stuff over the time and changed the trades around. But it's basically the same things. So we just keep rolling them in. And so honestly, we've only added, uh, what, we, we have nine positions now, and we had one, two, three, four, five, six then. We had uh, X went away, so we added four positions. So we took, so X went away and we added four new ones in the course of a year. That's how little we trade this portfolio. That's how long it takes us to decide to add something. Maybe once a quarter, we will add a position. So, you know, don't force it. You have to wait for something great to go on sale. All right. And feel free to ask me in chat and say, hey, Phil, is this good for the butterfly, blah, blah, blah. But what we're looking for is for big companies. You don't want a company that can get bought out. That's what blows you out in the butterfly portfolio. You do not want a company that's going to get bought out. That's bad. You don't want a company that's going to go bankrupt. That's also bad. But anything else, as long as the company stays in a channel and trades in a general area, we can make huge money out of it. And we did. So we turned. So this one was 193 last year, and now we're at um, what? Wow. Oh well, <laughs> that's, that's a little much. It's still much. So 320. We're up 326 percent from there. And we started with $200,000 in 2018. So we weren't up much last year. Hang on, let me figure that out. Do we add to it? Oh, I don't know from here. 193 is up 100%. I think at some point we added money. I think during the crash, we added $100,000 to the portfolio. So it raised our starting basis to 200000 but it was money well spent, of course, because uh, we, we jumped up tremendously. We made, we made a fortune because instead of putting our tail between our legs and, and running away, we added $100,000 uh, and the Greg got aggressively long in our positions back in uh, March. And that's why we're up such a ridiculous amount in the, in the butterfly portfolio. Um, anyway, so again, but that's the point. It's taking advantage when the, when the market is short. Oh, shit, here's power. Oh, anyway, so blah blah blah. Now, now we're down again because Powell has nothing really to say. When you you know the Fed statement, you can read whatever you want into it like tea leaves. But Powell, oh God, I didn't change my Dow play at all. Oh, stupid! Look, now it's, now it's lost. That's all right though. Um, so so the market from the from the reading of the minutes. Of the of the of the statement, ever the market went flying up. Now Powell's talking and giving some clarity, and people are getting a different kind of message. They're getting more of the message that I read into the into the statement, which is, you know, dudes, you're not taking into account what could go wrong. We are not being cautious enough, that's for sure. So anyway, okay, so butterfly B. So no, it's been bottom line with butterfly not to uh, do it. All right. But you want to find big stocks that are basically channel bound, which is hard to find this year. And you want to, and you don't want to be in the top of the channel because it loses money. Just like we made money, you lose money if you pick wrong. If you if you set up uh, bull call spreads and you pick it wrong, that's not good. Pal, 
half of the economy depends significantly on the coronavirus. People are like, what? <laughs> yeah. This is shocking news to some people. Oh, here's the dollar clock. Change, oh, no, change in GDP. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, other, again, it goes back to the same thing. Other than this stimulus that's boosting the economy this year, there is no long-term projection that we're gonna that we're gonna undergo undergo a growth period. And if all the stimulus is just a one-time thing, what the hell are we trading at thirty-five times earnings for? One year of 6% growth doesn't justify 35 times forward earnings. That's a big problem. So back, you know, back, back to where we were, this is a bounce. We had a little spike up and uh, it'll, it'll, now we got to see what actually happens. But I just, again, my whole premise was, I don't see what he can possibly say that's going to keep the markets this at this sustained pace. It just, it's just not enough you can possibly do. Now, our short-term portfolio is probably all over the place. Our short-term portfolio, we added a, a, a bunch of changes to. Now it's got crushed. It's down 13%, which is really, I think we were, I think we were green on Friday, so it's down 13% from last time because we got much more aggressively bearish. Um, we added this SQQ spread at brand new. And it's a uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars spread. Am I reading that right? It's the fifteen dollars times ten thousand is uh, oh one hundred fifty thousand. So it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars spread. We only spent not even twenty thousand, eighteen thousand dollars on it on one hundred fifty thousand dollars spread. That's it. It's a straight up eighteen thousand spent on one hundred fifty thousand spread. It's in the money, and it's in the money by three bucks. So it's in the money by thirty thousand, and it only cost us eighteen thousand dollars. So I think that's money well spent. I mean, if you want to do, if you if you're going to do a hedge, that's the way to do a hedge. Um, it's only up a little bit, so I mean, frankly, it's still net uh, two fifty. So so now it's a twenty five thousand dollars spread. So it's twenty five thousand dollars cost, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars spread. That's the way you hedge. And it's a twenty-five thousand dollars spread. It's thirty thousand dollars in the money. The only way you can lose your twenty-five thousand dollars is if the Nasdaq goes up. And if the Nasdaq goes up, hopefully your longs are going to make twenty-five thousand dollars, or you're overhedging. That's not complicated. We got Chipotle. Chipotle, I think, went back up. Unfortunately, that hurt. CMG. Yep. Um, you know, but it's nice. It's, it's doesn't matter. Uh, so Chipotle went back up. We have the long puts, the short call. What did we do? We have the short put, short put. We have the long put. We brought back, we bought back the short puts. That's what we did. So we had a we had a bear put spread. We bought back the short puts, and we were hoping it would go much lower, but it hasn't. So now we're now we're in the, now it's a very volatile spread, and these are after for January. So that's fine for now. Um, FXP, we're waiting for China to collapse, and 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 uh, oh, these are calls. Uh, FCO that didn't work out for us, and then I don't know if it's going to the oil trade. Where is CO? Charts, charts. Oil at 64.64 at the moment. And we have uh, FQQ. Oh, that's another, that's our old FQQ play. So our original FQQ play is down here. This was a new FQQ we added because again, we still think the NASDAQ is most likely to give us a good collapse. Um, TQQ, there you go again. Uh, another play on the NASDAQ, we go to TQQ play. Um, TZA. That's the, the big short on the Russell. And then we've got um, uh, what do they call Wayfair, Wayfair Furniture, which I think is just generally way overpriced, but so far so bad on that. Um, WWW. 
you know, the, I'm not going to go over it again and again, but I mean, the bottom line is it's a furniture store. It's an online furniture store. During Obviously, during COVID, people who needed furniture said, hey, how about the Wigman guy? They're on the Wayfair. They're online. And uh, people have been buying more furniture online because they can't go to the store. I don't think people generally would rather buy furniture online. Maybe they would. I don't know. I can't see how you do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a $5,000 couch online. And, and I don't know that I like it other than a picture. I don't know if it's comfortable to sit on. I don't get that. So I, I think there's still a place in the world with furniture stores we can go and sit in them. Um, why are there so many people? I'm looking on Bloomberg. There's got to be boy, five. There's a five by five box. There's 25 people in boxes on the screen. That's really crazy. Is Pal done already? Or is he answering questions? Oh, I see. These are the 25 people who are asking Pal questions. Our guidance is outcome based. So he's doing his QA right now. So you gotta, you know, we just have to let him let this thing run its course, see what happens, and see where it ends up. But it's not about what happens today, it's about how it's digested over the next couple of days and how the market overall reacts. But then what? You know, and that's the thing. We're, we're running out of things to, to boost the market. This is it. This is our Fed meeting. So at the moment, though, we're back to here, which is where we fell to yesterday. Let's keep in mind. So there's nothing spectacular about this. And I, I don't see what the next catalyst is going to be to push us any higher. Whoa, look at gold spiking. Whatever Pal said, though, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly just sending gold to the moon, right? Gold's up. Silver's up. Copper flying back up. Um, the dollar is staying steady, so that's not so bad. And oil improved a little bit, but that that oh that report on oil was not good today. They're like um, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has uh, they they basically said, look, this demand is not coming back for cut for a couple of years, not one year, a couple of years until demand returns to normal. And so, so I may have been a little off of my timing on the on shorting on the oil, but I still very much believe that sixty dollars is not sustainable. You know, and that's why we rolled that that position back a bit. Anyway, so we got that, we got that, and that no, well, that's well, that's where we are really. We're going to be, you know, we're you know because we have such big hedges in the short term portfolio, we have added longs to the long term portfolio. And uh, again, it's like I said, if, you're, if your hedges are hurting you, then you're doing it wrong. Nope, wrong one. Ooh, futures now in over 100, very good. Uh, Long-term portfolio. Also up a ridiculous amount, 240%. Um, so, well, that, what's that number now? 1.7, holy crap. We're, we're 100,000 away from $2 million. That's crazy. That is, by the way, that is when I shut down the other portfolios. We hit $2 million and I said, that's ridiculous. And, and, and frankly, we were all very glad that we did it, right? We were all really glad we cashed in last time. When we hit $2 million in the long-term plus short-term portfolio, I said, I can't, I can't keep going like this. It makes me too nervous. Because it's no longer about making money. It's about not losing the $2 million. You know, and, and of course we are mostly in cash. We've only we've got one million dollars in cash out of 1.7 million in this portfolio. So you know we are very much in cash, but still there's there's exposure here. This is a lot of positions, and you don't want to have to unwind these because the market is crashing. You know, but on the other hand, now the Nasdaq is up, the S and P's up, the Dow's up 200. You know, it, the market just reacts incredibly well to anything anybody says. Any little nugget of a thing that, that gives it the excuse to go up, it goes higher. So, you know, it's hard to get out because of the fear of missing out, because we're worried that we're going to get out, and then what are we going to have? 
know what? I don't want to miss a, another leg of a rally up just in case it, to rebuild. And that's the thing. You can't rebuild these positions. And don't forget how much we love these positions. Every single position here, we love. We have tried and tried and tried to cut these back. And every single time we review them, we say, I can't do it. This is too good. I mean, you go back to our, our uh, last review, blah, 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 blah. So look at our last full review. Was this a long term in here? Yeah. No, no, what is this? The money talk. Oh, I see. We already did the money talk today. I mean, we did the LTP the day before. Whoa. Oh, my, oh, I'm sorry. Money talk. That was money talk. And it was 62%. And have money talk now. Because we certainly didn't touch that one. 73%. So, we, so since... The last review, the money for portfolio is up, up 11%. That's nice. Um, and that, and, and of course, we didn't touch it. We didn't change a thing. That's just the way these positions moved in the last month. So, you know, how do you, how do you take your money off the table if that's what's happening? If you're making 11% a month, how do you take the, how do you close it down? Why, you know, it's so hard. It's like, we, that's why we just add more money to the hedges to protect what we have. Because shutting it down seems like crazy when you're making 11% a month. You know, we just take a portion of that money and put it into more hedges every single time. So where was that? We have a long-term portfolio. Part two, we want part one. See, our total last, uh, what day was this? Um, 218. Our total one month ago was 1766. Now the long term portfolio is 1.7, and the short term portfolio is about 200. So we're up 130,000 bucks. We're up almost 10% up between the, on the long and short portfolio together are up almost 10% for the month. And we bear it, we didn't change the long-term portfolio very much. And all we did was add more hedges to the short-term portfolio. But anyway, I write this, I mean, I write this all the time, but it's bottom line, you know, what do we do? Harmony, uh, Macy's, you know, it's basically total Baba. I, I write about these, like if I think something's good or bad or good for a new trade, uh, you know, Berkshire, you know, this is typical of Berkshire. We're well over our target, so we turn into kind of a butterfly play to make money on it. Uh, China Mobile is broken, we know. Cisco on track. F FL is so is too much in the money. Gilead, we bought it twice and it's already at our goal. Uh, gold, we just came back in that one. Goldman Sachs. You know, these are all, you know, the commentary you can see. It's like we can't sell these. IBM was the stock of the year. IMAX was the stock of the year runner up. Intel is our current stock of the year. 3M makes the freaking mask that everybody's running around wearing. Um, you know, Plains Pipeline, Pfizer makes the virus drugs. How do you, I mean, why would I sell Pfizer? Why would I sell 3M? That's that's what's hot in, tw in 2021. You know, and until I, until people stop wearing masks, I don't see any reason to stop having Pfizer and 3M in that portfolio. Uh, Tango, Tango Factory Outlet, of course, is obviously uh, coming back with the virus thing. Uh, Sun Power, Crazy, AT&T, Valero, Walgreens. I mean, sell them why? Walgreens, you know, Valero is an energy play. AT&T is ridiculously cheap. Uh, Walgreens Boots is, again, another vaccine play. Uh, Wheat and Precious Metals came back in that portfolio. Uh, Western Union, we decided it was a good idea, and that's turning out well. You know, <laughs> we didn't make a lot of changes. Notice that this is all black. There's very little blue in the, in the long-term portfolio. There's no reason to change anything. But no reason to change anything went from 1609 to 1 1.7. We're up $100,000. That's crazy. 
So how do you sell it? How do we get out? How do we stop? How do we break? How do we get out of a portfolio that's performing like this? And I and I know a lot of you might be thinking, oh, you don't, but it's like, I don't know. At some point it's going to stop. And I don't want to be in it when it stops. I want to, I want to cash out at the right time. And and last cycle, $2 million was up. I mean, because we started with 600000 We started with a $500,000 long-term portfolio and a $100,000 short-term portfolio. And when we add the money to the short-term portfolio, it comes out of the long-term portfolio. So it doesn't come from nowhere. So in other words, it's all balanced out. But so another $600,000 start, and you get to two million, that means you're past a triple. Uh, you, got, you know, it's just so unlikely to sustain itself for another year. So let's say that you go from two million to 2.5 million, but then there's a 20% correction. How much is 20% of 2.5 million? 2 million. And that's that's the point I made last time. In other words, we had, last time we had $2 million, and I said, let's cash it out. Why do we cash it out? Because we could start with another 600,000 and play it aggressively. Rather than play the $2 million conservatively, we took $2 million off the table, kept 1.4 million in cash on the side, and then put $600,000 back to work aggressively. And that aggressively paid off because what happened is when the market crashed in March, we were down and, and we added 100,000 to the short-term portfolio, and we added $100,000 to the, uh, um, um, to the butterfly portfolio, and we, and we added, um, $100,000 to the dividend portfolio. So we, we added money to three of our portfolios because we wanted to take advantage of the crash. But we had oodles of money on the side. That was the point. So even though we, we thought that the market was going to crash, even though, and this was back, by the way, in September of last year, of, uh, not last year, September of 2019, we thought the market was going to crash any minute. It took until March to crash. And it crashed not even for the reason we thought it was going to crash, but it crashed really hard. And we, well, thank God we didn't have $2 million invested. That's how it was. We only had $600,000 invested. We were happy to put $300,000 more into our portfolios. And from that, we were super aggressively long and the market came flying back and all of our portfolios made ridiculous amounts of money this year. But now we're back at the same dilemma. We have $2 million and it's very, very, very unlikely that we're gonna go past 2.5 million before we hit a correction. And if we don't go past 2.5 million before there's a correction, then what are we even doing? Then we're wasting our time. So $2 million gaining 500,000 more dollars and then a 20% correction of the 2.5 million we have Back to two million dollars. So I don't want, and it's the same logic. I don't want to play that game. I would rather start with an aggressive six hundred thousand dollars. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't work out, we only lose six hundred thousand dollars, and we still have one point four million on the side. So we're getting close to that point again. Nothing drastic this week, which is, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to do the review. But God knows how I'm going to have time to write all these reviews. But we're going to finish up. We're going to do our reviews for the next two days. And, um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not going, you know, even now, looking at these long-term positions, I'm not going to knock all these things out. But if we make, you know, that's my threat. If we make more money, if, if we make another two hundred thousand dollars or another hundred thousand dollars next month, I am gonna, I, I am gonna be very much inclined to pull the plug, unless things look incredible and the economy is picking up 
and the virus is great and everything's good and blah, 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 unless everything is so hunky-dory that I, that I now become a convert to the great new American economy, blah, blah, blah. I just can't see it. I can't see how I can keep going like this. So you guys got to think about your situation too and think about taking something off the table. And you've got to go through your portfolios with a fine tooth comb and make sure that you are really clear that, you know, and don't forget, we're in half cash. So we already have taken a lot of stuff off the table. But I don't, I don't want any exposure. This is still $551,000 that can, that can disappear. That's that security value, 551. I don't like having that much exposure right now. I'm not happy about how much money is still on the table. So you got to go through your portfolios and think about that too. Are you prepared for a 20% correction? Are you going to hold on through a 20% correction? And if you're not, then what are you doing? If you're not gonna, if you're not going to hold on through a 20% correction, and you're going to panic sell while the market is going down, why not sell now while it's high? What do you stand to lose? You stand not to lose 20%. You stand to maybe not gain 20%. But you're not going to stop playing. You're just going to cash out and play with less. You're not going to make zero. You can be a little bit, you can be pretty aggressive if you put some money to work. But it doesn't have to be your whole portfolio. It doesn't have to be everything on the line. All right. So just consider that and we'll talk about it a lot more in the next month. All right. Thank you everybody for coming. And we will do this again next week after we adjust our portfolios and see where everything stands. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.